water is crucial to life. That's why we've invited three experts who seek to ensure that all beings have access to the water they need to survive and thrive. They are Yelizaveta Demidenko, a senior program associate at the Global Water Partnership, Maduka Swayambu, the co-founder and research head of Vaidik Sarijan LLP, and Rajaj Kuma, a sustainability professional at TRLK Kozaki. After their presentations, they kindly took questions from the audience. I'll be looking at some questions, but to kick things off, one of the things that came up is to do with uh, the role uh, that we can play as individuals, as humans, looking at uh, promising technological innovations that could play towards uh, the water stewardship. So keen to sort of see maybe some thoughts on this, uh, practical advice, as well as uh, how to actually be part of the solution as opposed to continue being part of the problem statement as we find ourselves. And uh, in no particular order, if anyone wants to jump in on that. So I think uh, the best that uh, individuals can contribute towards is to understand water and uh, build on uh, a sustainable career in water restoration itself. Because the water stress that we have across the globe is not because water has moved out of the planet. Not even a single drop of water has gone outside of the planet. What water was available 10,000 years back is still there, right? It is we human beings who have contaminated, who have polluted the water by dumping in our industrial wastewater, by our domestic sewage into the water bodies. So what we need to restore is the water bodies, which were the key source of a lot of ecosystem services that I explained into uh, my presentation. And everybody can actually contribute towards it because nature is a self-healing phenomena, right? We have just recently recovered from a global pandemic. I mean, everybody was under lockdown. And all newspaper, all uh, TV news channels, everybody reported that rivers have started becoming cleaner. Water bodies have started becoming cleaner because nature was reclaiming itself. We were just reducing the intervention. So I think everybody has got a role to play. Um, our Honorable Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi, had uh, come up with the concept of mission life uh, during the Glasgow summit. Uh, and uh, that's a wonderful concept for every individual uh, to play a role in restoration of the natural resources. So yes, definitely uh, everyone has got a role to play. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, anyone else who wouldn't jump in and um, very valid point that uh, uh, water is a finite resource and uh, some people don't necessarily um, know about it or share in that sort of point of view. But it is true. Water is definitely a finite resource and we need to be very proactive about how we use such a resource. Uh, Yeli Saveta, I think you, you want to jump in on this one as well. Go ahead. Yeah, just very simply, to be honest, what, what we've seen through through our work is that the biggest um, um, kind of added value that the people get is from engaging with their local authority or with the national authority that is responsible for water management. It is essentially whether you're private sector, whether you're civil society, whether you're researching, you know, uh, more efficient water uses, it is where the power is over the water resources in your country. And I think this is where you can also make a difference. So engage with them and make sure that your your opinions and your solutions are heard. And from what we're seeing, um, in we've, we've had many cases where you know a country would report and and self assess itself is very high on the uh, IWM level. So they believe that they have a very high score for implementation of integrated water resource management, but that score either gets lower but we see a score lowering in particular aspects such as like let's say institutions and participation after um this goes through a multi-stakeholder consultation process when all of those opinions are taken into account it is really much easier to um to ensure that the action that follows is very targeted and actually addresses the problems that exist so this kind of like self-critical look at how we're doing all together because you know government doesn't exist in isolation and it's also represented by 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 citizens 
I think that is the part where uh, we can achieve the most impact to ensure that this finite, finite res resource that Madhuka pointed out is managed sustainably. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for that. And uh, Rajesh, did you want to jump in on this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just connecting with the other two speakers. If you see, I hope today in practical situation, like uh, when, I, uh, when we consider all these years, no, every year there is a change in water availability and the awareness to us water is much changed every year. Even I can connect one uh, example in my own place uh, in India. So many people, you know, they used to show, start to shift their location, like to change their hometown or location due to very less availability of water or water scarcity. Water, uh, water scarcity. So that is why it is very much important. I am connecting to the first presentation was very interesting from Ms. Elsiva, where she told, no, like every country, there is a geographically water should be shared. So I hope in future, this type of initiatives also to be done both uh, regional level and uh, country level. That will be the only solution because water is not equally distributed. So I hope everyone have, but if you see, everyone has uniform access to water. So I hope that is the key point. And one more thing, what I want to mainly add is, uh, if you see today, uh, when we discuss with various professionals across the geography, one thing is very evident is uh, today, I think in every country, we are in peak in terms of uh, technology, in terms of our intellectual awareness, and in terms of access to the media or uh, like power of buying. But other side, I hope uh, one area where everyone should be aware or conscious is our individual lifestyles and behavior. Like uh, even when I was just recently exploring our uh, videos from Thrive. There was an interesting video about uh, how much water is used to make a jeans pant. So we think water only as a direct resource, but indirectly, if you see uh, whatever we do, it is connecting to water. Even when, when, I drink, when I drink a water from a paper cup or a plastic cup or my own steel container, everything make a difference. But this change will happen only if there it happens in awareness level. So I, uh, this, I take this opportunity to appreciate the everyone no, in the Thrive Team, I hope you are doing a wonderful job, and uh, I can lot of uh, awareness you are creating, and I hope it should be spread across everyone. And I hope definitely it will create some change. Poor sees or you know, when they try to ready to take some action, surely it will uh, make lot of action. And like every drop, they say water there is a proverb. So every drop make a mighty ocean. So every everyone like some little little uh, actions, finally it will come out as uh, like. You know, like solid concrete actions will come out. So that is the key message I want to share today. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks for that, um, Rajesh. So, as I was pointed out by Madhuka, uh, is that um, all you know, most products and services require large quantities of water as part of the manufacturing process, and that's something that sometimes gets overlooked as well. Uh, moving on, uh, we've got a question here from uh, one of our audience members. Um, this is for Madhuka, um, and it's to do with what is the percentage age of recycled water in India for domestic consumption? I assume this came from one of your slides. Oh, actually, I already answered that into the chat itself. In uh, Bharat, we don't uh, use recycled water for domestic purposes. It is primarily used for horticulture purposes as well as uh, some part of the industry uh, wherein they are using water for uh, the cooling towers and all that. Uh, so that is where the recycled water is used. Uh, like uh, uh, cooling tower is the most uh, common usage of the recycled water. Apart from that, uh, there are uh, also a lot of industries that uh, use water for washing purposes, like any kind of ore, any kind of uh, mining industry, uh, whether it is coal washing or whether it is the ore washing, uh, there also the recycled water is used. But the recycled uh, water in India, in Bharat, is not used for domestic purposes uh, primarily, right? Except for um, uh, some... Uh, new age apartments wherein they they have the sewage treatment plant and the recycled water gets connected to the flushing purposes and all that, uh, not for the, the drinking or not for the kitchen usage at all. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks for for responding to that from one of our audience members. Um, I have another question here. There's quite a few here, but uh, I'll pick one out. Um, 
provide examples. Okay, this is for Yeli Saveta. Um, this is about providing examples of successful implementation of policies based on uh, the indicators from different regions. So some um, case studies or successful examples. Yes, absolutely, and I'm and I'm looking now for for the link to be honest to um to provide you those examples, but perhaps I can mention them really quickly. So, um, our program, the SDG six Edinburgh Support Program, is goes in three stages. So at first, we as as I said, help to collect this data, and then it's the second stage where we try where we help countries to put up an action plan on how to. On the challenges that you identified through this data collection, and so just a couple of examples. For example, in in Panama, a support program in in 2021-2022 facilitated the development of an uh, IDBRAM action plan from 2022 to 2026. That was followed with a 3.3 million USD government budget investing into water security, which was also aligned with the strategies that the country already had for uh, climate adaptation. So basically, the, the activity that was put forward for climate adaptation included several water-related activities, but they were really very sporadic. And so this kind of action plan helped to supplement the climate action of the country and kind of, you know, pulling their resources together to finance it. Similar, it was, um, there was um, a similar plan adopted in Nicaragua, where was the country identified about 16 priority action that um, but don't only focus on SDG 6, but rather the government used the SDG 6 um, as an entry point to look at how this action on water could help achieve other targets that the country has under different other SDGs, like energy, for example. And so basically, um, and, and that plan also ensured like a quite a robust like monitoring framework, engaging stakeholders to review how that is, is going on. Um, so, and a similar situation was in Nepal, let's say, where, I mean, there was a little bit less priority actions um, identified, but also, you know, bridging, you know, water and climate to help the country find a, a perfect entry spot of how to act on, on the IDBRAM implementation. And if you want us to explore a bit more and like go really in depth to into those the results, I'm going to leave a link here. And then if you have any particular questions, you're free to to reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer more questions on that. Yeah, now that uh, many thanks for that. Yeah, definitely. If you have any links and so forth, opportunity for those to be shared via our uh, news service as well for those people who are listening in and you can follow up on additional information uh from uh Yelsaveta and from, from her organization who does a lot of work specifically in this space so thanks for that um i have a question here for rajesh um what are the most critical threats to water centric ecosystems today and what strategies can be implemented to mitigate these threats by government um by governments, uh, I assume, or and company and common and the common man and individuals as such. Uh, perhaps if you keep the answer short, so everyone else will have a chance to also get their few their questions in. Uh, over to you, Rajesh. Yeah, thank you for this uh, question. As I rightly said, uh, the water now should be approached in uh, co audible, three hundred and sixty degree. And it also uh, requires collective participation uh, from the government, from the technical people, engineers, community level. And every problem, like uh, there can be a there can be a single standard. Many times it is uh, specific to the geography and uh, specific to the uh, locations. For example, I have seen uh, there is a place called Thirupur. It is full of textile industry. There are like it's called as mini Japan. They used to make lot of t-shirts so when i were doing university we were used to do some internship at the uh, like industries so there is a common effluent treatment plant will be there where uh, effluent from every industry is collected and treated but some industries uh, like in small scale they what they do they let out the water into the nearby uh, like river or something where the nearby farmers are uh, getting affected so i hope there are some uh, if you see today, I think as uh, sorry the presentation, if you see eighty percent of wastewater is uh, not properly treated. There is a solution, but it is not covering all hundred percent. So now I think we need to scale up to cover on the wastewater part. 
the same thing applies to the restoration like if today like all natural bodies are like disturbed like so in that way if you see uh, in every area we do we are doing uh, some actions but if you see the intensity or severity is no, not enough we need to scale up and we need to like uh, support from every individuals from technical people some like you see our Ms. Elisabeth has shared some interesting insights, you know, how there is uh, like diplomatic level things are there, it was very interesting. And if you see our Madhukar guy will come up with some new dimension, like recommendation he was uh, like insisting. So I think uh, like we need to have some uh, like uh, multiple level of uh, out of box thinking uh, to break the, all the conventional thinking what we had. And even water treatment, if you see a few years before, what the technology is now completely getting outdated. So when I were working in my first industry, uh, there was a concept called uh, evaporation was there, where uh, water will be treated and final digit will be evaporated. And many times they used to have landfill within the site. But today it, it, it's just banned by government. They are uh, like banning the landfill within the industry. And the evaporated technology is not there. They, they are not supporting. They want to upgrade the technology. Like cell phone, we say today like 4G, 5G. Similarly, you know, for water also, we need to upgrade our thinking, upgrade the technology to address this type of uh, issues. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I'll go over to another question here for uh, Yeli Saveta. Um, I guess this comes from one of your slides. Uh, you mentioned that in Asia, Latin America and North Africa, only four out of 68 countries sharing transboundary waters have 90% of their transboundary basins covered by operational arrangements. Uh, what measures uh, could be put in place, uh, I guess, to improve these efforts? So it's a very, very interesting question. So if if I'm allowed to um to to go back to my slides just to illustrate what's what's what I'm talking about. So and this relates to the criteria that I put into indicators. So the key word is this operational arrangement. So basically, what happens is that. If agreement is not operational, if it doesn't work, it's not counted towards the indicator. So there are four criteria that determine this operationality. So how do we know that it's working? First, there is a joint body. There's some kind of joint working group or institution among the two states managing this water. There's formal meetings at least once a year. There is some kind of joint management plan or objectives. And they're exchanging information. So, hence, the first step would be to see if there is some kind of joint institution that is trying to manage this water. Maybe it's an interministerial working group. So, try that. Second would be to actually make sure that that group meets regularly, regularly in this case, at least once a year. So, that's the second step. Third, See if you could, uh, if those consultations, if those meetings can help them to achieve joint objectives. Let's say they would adopt a joint investment plan and listing the priority projects, let's say water infrastructure in that basin, or they would uh, have um, exchange of information. So let's say um, monitoring of water quality, and then they establish a shared um, water data system that would qualify that agreement to be operational. So any of these four, if any of these four fail, unfortunately, in the view of the, the global uh, 652 indicator, that agreement is considered as not to be working. And I would agree, to be honest, these are requirements are quite um, stringent. But I would say if 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 the group that if they if two ministries don't meet or two agencies, then to which extent is that uh, arrangement really working? They don't exchange data to which extent is that uh, really working? And the criteria reflect kind of the international principles of environmental law, which is duty to cooperate, uh, which I believe is essential, sorry, for effective management of water resources. And just to close the slide and then to refer to Maduka's answer in the chat, I absolutely agree with this point that, you know, the laws are there, but the enforcement is needed. Without this enforcement, without this putting the agreement to work, uh, I mean the, the the law doesn't doesn't really matter if it's not implemented. So try to to follow these practical steps and see if 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 that um, if that helps. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. So 
as we often say, a lot of the solutions to many of our pressing challenges in this in this world are actually known. Not everything, but many of the solutions are known. Uh, getting governments and individuals and corporations to follow them seems to be the the key uh, issue. Uh, actually, getting them to actually recognize the science and following the best advice, the best guidance from there. And uh, for all of us here involved in this field, that's exactly what we're hard at work, trying to ensure that we are sharing the science and informing the guidance in this uh, space.